Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and we are so glad you've decided to join us. And you're gonna really be glad you decided to join us this evening, and you wanna stay tuned because we're gonna be introducing our brand new host to Mid-American Gardener, Tanisha Shade Spain. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Now, if we had an audience, there would be a much bigger applause. Anyway, right, so we're really, really glad. And, and at the end of the show, you get to meet her and uh, learn a little bit more about her. So, and we always have a great group of people uh, to take your questions when it comes to gardening. And Jim Schuster, I've known you for many, many years, but why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay. I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired horticulturist and extension plant pathologist with the U of I. And my first question came from Quincy, uh, Dottie over there. He had a rhododendron that looks like it's dying. Uh, there's some webbing on the branches. He had three plants and only, uh, well, four plants and three of them look fine, but this one is dying. And I was looking at the pictures and he had mulch down. And the first thing I thought of was if I top the root rot because mulch holds uh, water around the roots and rhododendrons do not like that. But then uh, looking at the branches, it didn't match the symptoms for Phytophthora, but it does match a canker disease because if you look really close, some of the branches have darker brown spots in them against the gray, and that would indicate probably that she has Botrytis, I mean, uh, Bacisseria, which causes a canker. Now, if that ground was also bare instead of mulch, Phytophthora root rot can also cause cankers too on a rota dinner, but because of the mulch, I'm suspecting that she has Bostoseria that is spread by rain and wind and you can prune it out because there are no really good fungicides for canker type diseases. And uh, if the plant really looks bad enough, you may just want to consider ripping it out and either burning it if you can legally burn it where you live or dig a big hole, cut it up small and drop it in the hole and let it rot in the ground. Uh, so you minimize the spread of that disease. And you probably don't want to stick another rhododendron or mm -hmm. a in the same well, spot. Well, definitely if it's, not, if it's a phytophthora. Yeah, right, uh, right. And by the way, so the way, way you want to separate the phytophthora, you would have to look, dig down and look at the roots. Yeah. Uh, right. so and if tough. they're, uh, you're, and you're looking at it, they'll be black on the inside. And if they've already gone mushy, then you're really into the advanced decay up near the phytophthora root rot. Well, like I say, I don't think it's any root rot. I think it's all canker disease. So it's probably a good time to, you know, look right. at it for a replacement. Okay, very good, Jim. Thank you. And Mike. Hi, I'm Michael Brunk. I am the Urbana City Arborist. I manage the city's forestry program. I dabble in landscape beautification, and I'm also involved in managing the Landscape Recycling Center. And I have a write-in question about a dying spruce, and this is a very common problem. Uh, it's from Jeremy, and he's wanting to know what's... Uh, uh, causing dieback in his spruce and he has one that's uh, almost completely dead. Uh, he's trimmed some of the lower branches. Uh, he's concerned that it could be spreading to his other uh, trees because they're showing some signs of dieback as well. There's two likely problems that you have in your spruces, at least one, um, possibly two, and the common problems are rhizosphera needle cast and cytosporous canker. Now rhizosphera, needle cast, it'll affect everything but the new growth. So you'll have green tips, and behind the green tips, you'll have dieback. Cytosporous canker, on the other hand, you'll have dieback through the entire branch, and it's characteristic. You'll see little bird dropping type sap markings on the inner parts of the branches and trees. So they, they're little white spots, they look like bird droppings, and that's a common sign of cytosporous canker. Cytosporous canker is not treatable. You probably should take the tree down and start over. Rhizosphera is treatable. You can treat that in the springtime. Uh, and if you get a good certified arborist to look over those trees, they could probably guide you on how to treat, uh, what kind of a fungicide and exactly when to do it. I think it takes two treatments. One is the caps break and start to grow and then another one down the road a couple weeks later. But your decision is, I think the tree that's mostly gone, you probably want to get it down and start over. The others that are lightly uh, being affected to trim the dead wood out, but don't do it in wet weather. In fact, it's best to wait till winter, probably late winter, to get that dead wood out of there. 
Okay. Okay. Very good. And really, probably on both of these problems with the with the azalea rhododendrons as well as the spruces is is checking out the University of Illinois Plant Clinic. It's always a good you know if you really think of taking a sample in and sure. along with some pictures sometimes that helps too. But yeah, because right. sometimes that can be really confusing with diseases. So thank right. you very much. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. And Phil, hopefully no disease problems, Phil. <laughs> no, I am the disease. Oh, you are the, the disease. Oh, okay, okay. Very good. As long as we're clear. I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois Extension. And this is summertime, and summertime means grubs. Uh, <laughs> in the latter part of June and early through early July, we have the adult beetles out, Japanese beetles, as you're seeing there, as well as a June bug or or mass chafer, and they will lay eggs in the soil, going to areas that have a lot of nice green grass, and those eggs will hatch in the larvae, which will feed in the root zone of the plant, uh, causing, uh, causing the dieback of the top growth of the, uh, of, of, the, of the turf. The grubs get up to about an inch long, and they're C-shaped with three pairs of brown legs, and you'll end up getting large areas of, of brownish turf uh, where the weeds will be fine because these grubs really specialize on feeding on grass roots. And so that's one way you can tell that. Uh, we've had a lot of rain over the last couple of weeks and uh, that, that, that uh, tendency has a tendency, seems to be continuing. And if we have nice green grass through about the middle of July, which is the first half of July is when the eggs are laid of the grubs, we probably won't have much in the way of grubs because white, the adult beetles will lay their eggs everywhere, uh, watered areas, unwatered areas, uh, roadsides, everything, and it'll be spread out enough, nobody will have much of a problem. And so then you kind of need to be watching to see if you've got a problem showing up in the early part of August. But a preventative treatment, if we have good green grass through the middle of July, should not be, uh, sh it should make it such that it spreads about, people don't have much of a problem. So if you have a lawn care company that's saying they've got to treat your grubs, tell them to prove it to you because <laughs> they may not be able to. Uh, and uh, if you're treating your own, make sure that you don't have any flowering weeds in your in your turf because many of the grub treatments that you can buy are going to be kind of rough on the pollinators. So you want to have good weed control before you would use a grub product. But that's just a really good point as in, you know, just don't put down grub treatment because you think it's a, you're supposed to do that every year, whether you're supposed, whether you have grubs or not, just really find out if it really is a problem. And as you said, some years it's going to be worse than others. It's so much it's, worse usually you know, in, doing it. in watered lawns in dry years. Right, and right. This year it's kind of different from that. Yeah, yeah. We, all, we always kind of say that, that kind of thing that the people that really take care of their lawn tends to be the one in those drought periods that tend to get more grubs. But thank you very much, Phil. And uh, don't forget the podcasts. And this week, it really going to be a good one because you're actually going to get a chance to learn a little bit more about our brand new Mid American Gardener host, Tanisha Shade Spain. She is actually the uh, podcast person and Victoria does a great job of putting those yeah. together. And so it's really a lot of fun. You can learn more about her and actually uh, toward the end of the show, you'll also get to meet her. So we're all very excited about that. So check out the podcasts. So we're going to go ahead and go to our lines and on line three, we have May from Decatur. It sounds like you have a pepper plant issue, May. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Um, the lower leaves on my red pepper plants are falling off and are on the ground. I thought it was a, a rabbit, but every day I go out there and they're um, on the ground. So they're falling off green? Yes. Or they, oh, they're falling off green. <laughs> Everybody looks at each other like, oh. Yeah, I have no clue. So it's being watered just fine. I mean, it seems like it's got plenty of water. It's not getting too much water. Those kind of things that might be an issue or... It's just what the rain has uh, rained right. on it. And, and it's only the bottom leaves, the bottom leaves up, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I don't know of any disease that would do that to a pepper. Because usually the the leaves would like turn yellow yeah. or something like that that might indicate there's something else going on there, like right. either fertility issues or something along uh, those lines. Let me Can ask you know this: Are, Is the leaf falling off with a petiole intact, or is it just the leaf? Oh. It's just the leaves. Somebody it's kind of yellow, yellowy brown. Oh, the leaves are brown. Kind of. Okay, and the petiole staying on the plant, or is that disappearing? The pepper's still there. No, no, yeah. no. The petiole. The, the stem. Of the, the stem. Leaves. Of the leaf. It sounds like it sounds like there may be maybe a water issue or something along those lines. If they're yeah, actually kind of turning yeah, a little bit. Yeah, some drainage problem maybe. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I would just wonder if, if it's getting good growth on it, maybe that's I, maybe one of those sort of temporary things and just make sure it's not getting too wet might be an issue. Okay, I will try to see if I can make it stop raining. I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, good luck on that. Uh, but just make sure you don't overwater. But what I was thinking is to make sure that it may be one of those things, if it seems like it continues, you might actually even want to just dig the plant up and lift it and see what's going on with the roots. That, well, that's what yeah. I would really well, worry about. Well, I'm going to suggest issue. that you just dig a hole about four inches deep and leave it open. You know, about the size of a cup, dig it yeah. four inches down, and uh, see if water goes into it or when it rains, how fast it drains, drains away. Out. Yeah. If it takes more than six hours, you got bad drainage. Yeah, because peppers don't like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, we can't be a little bit more specific on that, May, but good luck. Hopefully it'll quit losing well, leaves. A the solution next year would be to raise those up on a mound. Yeah, that's possibly. what I wonder. No, it raised, mm -hmm. Yeah, raised, raised. Okay. And on line five, we have a Carm from Urbana, and a found, you found a moth larva. That sounds exciting. What can we do for you, Carm? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't really know what they were. We were digging in the mulch this week. We are putting down some stepping stones, and so we were we cleared the, uh, the mulch back and then dug up some soil. And when we moved the mulch away from the soil and then dug in the soil, we found these white balls that are about the size of mothballs. And they were, whenever, you could pick them up, but if you squeeze them or tried to flatten them, they were squishy, and I, they were perfectly round, and they were buried in the soil, in the top of the soil of mulch, and I wondered if that's, we've had a lot of moths, and I wondered if it was moth larvae or if it was some kind of an, because when I smashed a couple of them, <laughs> they were mucousy. Uh, did you, uh, were, are these about the size of a head of corsage pin, about an eighth of an inch in diameter? Mm, they're the size of the old-fashioned marbles that we used to play with oh, as moth kids. Mothballs, I think she said, too. Mothballs, moth yes. Ball. Oh, they were huge moth then. Oh, so they're... <laughs> half an inch across <laughs> or so, huh? How, Pardon me? Half an inch across or so, is that what you're seeing? Yes. Okay. Um, how many were you seeing per square foot? You know? Oh, probably five or six. I have a clue in the world. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest, Phil. No, I don't have a clue. I don't know. Well, you know Nothing what I wondered about was, um, you know, some guys, uh, fungus. Yeah, I'm you know, a sometimes I wonder about fungus. Yeah, either, might be something like that. Yeah, like a well, like ball. before, like mushrooms is like before they actually go oh, ahead and yeah, do the full yeah. fruit fruiting. You know, where they produce spores and stuff like that. I wondered but if it wasn't just I've, a mushroom. I've had people ask me about puff balls, both yeah. below and above ground. Yeah. That's what I really wondered, mm -hmm. and maybe it was along and, those lines. Yeah, at first when she was mentioning it, and I thought it was a uh, 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 delayed reaction fertilizer that'll come in little balls like that, but they're about uh, an eighth of an inch in diameter. And the but, uh, yeah, I was going to say the puff ball so won't be real stuff. juicy. It'll be squishy, but it won't be juicy like an insect. Okay, yeah. Wow, yeah, that's a good one. You may have to take a picture for us. <laughs> there's no insect that I'm aware <laughs> you may have of that to take will a picture be that big like that. <laughs> Send us a picture. We really want to know about that one. But I mean, it doesn't sound like it's anything to worry about. That's no, probably the big thing. No. It's nothing to worry about. Okay. Okay, and on line three, we have Kay from Jacksonville. And it looks like you have some issues with irises, Kay. Yes, they uh, seem to be dying from the tips. And um, uh, I've, they're not planted too deep. They Some of them bloomed but uh, some just look really bad. The, how long has it been since you've divided them? Is it really thick? No, they're not. Uh, I divide them about, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Do yeah. you have uh, brown streaks going down the center of the leaves? Yes. That's probably iris borer. Uh, iris borer will lay, the moth will lay its eggs up on the leaves and then they, and then the, then the then the insect will tunnel down through the leaf, giving you a brown track. And many times the tip of the iris leaf will turn brown as afterward, after it does that. And it will go down to the corm or the, the bulb, so to speak, actually the corm of the iris and attack that. If you've got tall bearded iris, they have large enough corms that they will usually survive that. But they get a, that they can get a, get a, get it fairly easily. 
Smaller cormed irises such as Japanese iris and Siberian iris get it very uncommonly, but when they do, it tends to kill the plant. Mm. Uh, there isn't a whole lot you can do to prevent that. Uh, insecticides that used to be available are pretty much off the market. Uh, the, probably the best thing you could be, be looking at would be, uh, would, would be uh, uh, one of the orthene type materials that you can put into the soil. It'll be so acetate, which would be sold as orthene, may give you some effect. Other people have luck digging up the irises and pulling out the borers, but I think you kind of got to be a surgeon at heart to be able to do that <laughs> and, and have the plants live very well. So she might want to go ahead and dig them up. Dig and them up. Matching. And, and what you'll find is, uh, is later in the summer, uh, they will be uh, big fattish caterpillars uh, about uh, an inch and a quarter long and about as big as your little finger. I mean, they are, they're, they're heavy bodied, full figured, uh, white to pinkish larvae. Okay, okay, so that'd be a good investigation. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. And we're gonna go ahead and go to our other email questions. Mm -hmm. And Jim, what do you have for us? Okay, Jane from Farmer City has a lot of Julia. Uh, they've been in the past in full bloom uh, at this time of year, which is basically over in May when she sent this in. Um, and this year, only a few branches had blooms and the pl overall plant had a lot of dead stuff in it. And she wants to know why. And she thought maybe it was drought, cold winter, old age. Well, um, I'm not sure it's going to be old age. Um, we had some winter damage on other plants, but the uh, other thing that you may have verticillium wilt. Verticillium wilt is a soil-borne disease, and it likes plants under stress. And with all the rain we've been having, you know, we had a wet March, we had a cold April, and we're having, you know, had a May was also wet. Um, I wouldn't be surprised that you got verticillium wilt. And one of the ways to check for that is uh, go down to the base of the plant uh, on one of those dead stems and cut into the sap wood and see if you see uh, brown streaking in wood that should have been uh, creamy white. And uh, the other thing would be if you can't find it there, then you have to go in and find the roots and look at the roots and see if you have brown streaking in the roots. And if you do, you're out of luck. Yeah, so that is one of the things. And yeah. we have had an awful lot of callers, it seems like, that have talked about how they had winter damage. Right. You know, it didn't seem like it was that different of a winter, but yeah. a lot of people have done But again, that, so. if you okay. don't feel comfortable doing it, you can do what you said before, take a sample, uh, hopefully a pretty large sample if you want to have them cut it up, but take it to your extension office or send it to a see plant clinic. Can. Okay. Super, thanks, Jim. And then on line three, we're going to go back to our callers. And on line three, we have Dan from Effingham, and you have a grass question. What can we do for you, Dan? Yes, on my lawn, every year I fertilize it. I put weed killer on it, and I don't ha I don't have a single weed in my yard. But this time of the year, I get uh, like a yellow grass coming up, and when you mow it, it don't disappear. It just lays there. It's like a yellow. The grass blades themselves look yellow. The grass, the whole yard turns kind of a yellowish color. Oh. Hmm. Rust. Yeah. Well, I, that's what I wondered. Maybe rust. Yeah. Yeah. Orange, more of the... It's not rust. I'm, I'm going to call it water grass or something like that. Oh, there's yellow oh. nut sedge. Yellow oh, nut sedge. maybe probably. yellow nut sedge. Yeah, and there isn't any good control for that that you can do. I know before I retired, there was a chemical that would be, could be applied by a tourist specialist that had a license to apply the chemical. I'm not sure if that chemical is still on the market or not. Yeah, there are a couple, three different uh, things. One is called called Sedge Hammer, and there are a couple others that are available and on the that uh, that are available to commercial people to use. And so, a lawn care company will be able to uh, do something for that to reduce that without having to renovate the whole lawn, which mm. is a fancy way of saying you kill it all and start all over. But uh, but yeah, a lawn care company will be able to address that issue for yellow nut sedge. But it might be good, this is really a good opportunity to remind people to get good, accurate identification because you really need to find out what's, what this right. is. And sometimes it's really hard for us to sort of, you know, just from a description, it's hard right. for us to get an idea. So if you want to go to your local extension office, uh, you can actually take in a sample and maybe they can get a, do a bet better job of uh, giving you some ideas of what that what that plant now be. some of that stuff if you if you catch it young and it comes in in a patch it's easy to pick out when it's young and you can actually hand pull that 
some of those sedges out, but yeah, it, yeah, certainly not very easy to do if it's all throughout your yeah, head. Yeah, accurate. Okay, very good. And on line five, we have Wanda from Champaign, and it sounds like, Wanda, you have some questions about mushrooms? On line five, Wanda? You have questions about mushrooms? Well, it's been a good mushroom year. I would, at least I would think it'd be a good mushroom year. Do you have a call? Wanda? Hi. Hi. Oh, I am she. Oh. oh, there you are. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to find out. I have mushrooms coming up in my front yard, and they're rather large, and, uh, uh, well, some of them are, okay. and they seem to break off at the bottom of it. But, and I thought that these mushrooms would have spores, but they may have to get bigger for that. Am I wrong? Because they came up once before and now they're up again. Okay, mushrooms. A actually, I just saw some, I drove by a yard and they had those fairy rings. Oh. Those white, those big giant yep. mushrooms that come, like, that they call fairy rings. So. Uh, uh, I'll answer if you, if you want to. I was just going to say, I have some mushrooms coming up in my yard, and they're just kind of sporadic, and I, it's just growing off the decayed turf that right. I grass clipping. So that's what I have. That's what it could be. And, and it also could be, if you got a tree in the area, you could have some dead tree roots, and they'll be growing off of that possibility, too. Most fungi that produce mushrooms are decay fungi, and they eat what's dead. So it could be anything. They can grow in mulch. They can grow in a tree that right. died. Even I had some that were coming up like five years after a tree had died. Um, they, so, so I guess the bottom line is that generally you don't have to worry about it. If it really bothers people, they could rake them up or get rid of them that way. But I would like to make one comment, though. If you don't eat them. Because yeah, for every idea. one that's edible, there's one that looks just like it that will kill you, you or make you it know. really sick. And it takes uh, an expert almost to be able to identify okay. that. Uh, basically, okay. you find somebody that's been mushroom hunting for 50 years and is still alive. That's you what I always say. You always go out with an old mushroom hunter. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you very much. And we really have an exciting night tonight because we're going to give you a little bit of a teaser when it comes to our brand new host. We're so excited to have uh, Tanisha Shade Spain. And she's here to just give us a little bit of an idea of the kinds of things that she's been involved in. Hi, my name is Tanisha Shade Spain, and I'll be taking over as the new host of Mid American Gardener beginning July 12th. I just want to tell you how excited I am to be joining this team and learning right along with you every week with our expert panelists. Gardening and growing things has long been a passion of mine, and I'm even currently enrolled in the Master Gardener program here at Illinois. So again, I'm really excited to join this team, and I cannot wait to see what we all learn. So join me beginning July 12th. Great, Tanisha. And here, she's here in person. <laughs> I, I tell you, Tanisha, I've really had a lot of fun being the interim host, but I am so glad that you are you now are a part of this program and you're going to be the brand new host. So why don't you give people maybe an idea, obviously a great video that you had there out at the Idea Garden, I might add. And it was gardeners. so hot that day. <laughs> <laughs> you look very composed. Powder, powder, powder. Yeah, you look amazingly <laughs> composed. Now, I know one of the things is you actually just finished the, ma or finishing up the Master yeah. Garden. Yes. Programs. I want you to tell people a little you know, about this them. whole thing was sort of like a perfect storm because <laughs> where in the world do you you know come up with someone who has TV experience and who is into gardening and then it just so happened that I was in the program and so uh, it all just came together quite nicely. Now I'm doing the online Master Gardener program, so it's been a breeze. Like I was telling you earlier, I can put my headphones in and my kids <laughs> can run around the house and do whatever, and I'm still in the classroom. So yeah, we just started brand new online, so I hope people get it. If you do have a chance to, to check that mm -hmm. out they certainly could could do that and actually one of the instructors might just be mr phil nixon who was just yes. on you were saying i recognized just... his voice the second i walked <laughs> in the studio from the bug chapter so <laughs> great, great so do you have anything in particular that you're like super interested in or what you kinds know, of gardening just things enough to be dangerous honestly <laughs> uh this like year at my house i've got anything from honeysuckle to um, I've got lots of vegetables growing, and I right now we've got lots of peas and green beans that we're enjoying. Oh, and I'll tell you, this is the first year that I've grown the burgundy ones. And so nice. when they turned green while they were cooking, everybody oohed and odd at my house. 
So, you know, we're just experimenting. We've got fruit growing. We've got a lot of stuff growing. And so um, I'm just really proud because I've learned so much from the class that I was able to immediately put out into the garden. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. So as far as uh, project kinds of things, obviously you're going to be really, uh, you know, busy being part of the Mid-American Gardener yes. as Mid-American Gardener host. So we know you're going to be really busy with that. So are there other kinds of things that you really want to get into as far as... You know, yes. Projects or master My project? big thing is I want to get more kids involved in oh, learning how to grow. Um, my son goes to a magnet school and they have a garden there and I work in it every year. I'm one of the parent volunteers. And so they go outside and they till and they work the soil. They put the seeds in the ground. And I really honestly think that is so important because, right. you know, these kids just walk into the, they think everything comes from the grocery store. And so bringing back that love of gardening, I think, starting young, that's how I started. I was the bean breaker. You for my grandparents, so um, I think that's really important. Okay, well at least you weren't the weed puller. That's usually no. what people, and nobody nope. wants to do that kind of I stuff. I did the okay, beans, good. so. Well, thank you. Uh, I really wanna thank everybody here at the Mid-American Gardener uh, group and the, all the uh, video folks as well, producers, everybody. So I'm really very happy to pass the baton, <laughs> or the trowel, I should have had a trowel, <laughs> pass the trowel to Tanisha Shadespain. We're so excited to actually have her thank as a so part much. as the host now. And thank you and for all out. you. Oh, sure. I've, I've really enjoyed it, and you'll see me from time to time. Even yes, that's what I'm I was sure. going to say right before we left. You're not getting away. Pod, yeah, podcast You'll be over from here. time to time, maybe. <laughs> yes, and, absolutely. Yeah, and don't forget the podcast. Oh, thank you all very much. It's really been a lot of fun. We uh, Really, it's been such a great group of people to work with um, behind the camera as well as in front of the camera, so I know you'll have a good experience thank here. Thank you. And I'm looking, we're forward, looking forward, to forward to it. You. And, and you, you realize Diane was here for, let's what, 25 years wow. when wow. Diane was here? So. 25. You may have to Whoa, beat that. Whoa, that's the minimum commitment, eh? Yeah, that's the minimum <laughs> commitment. That's it. Anyway, so thank you all very much, and thank you to our panelists this evening. And remember, you can always connect with us either through the website or voicemail or send us an email. Have a great week gardening. Thank you.